Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this webinar. Thank you for taking uh, time out to join us for the session. Um, so customer success has been something uh, very, um, very near and dear to, uh, to us, of course. Uh, this is what we do day in, day out at Customer Success Box. And these strategies of the, the seven strategies of for dealing with seven type of customer churn has, has sort of emerged out of our discussions, of our, out of our experience and learning that we have had uh, from working with hundreds of um, B2B SaaS organizations and how they are dealing with churn and how all of those uh, things are uh, handled. So without further ado, let's proceed. Now, it's very clear that in the subscription economy, in the age of subscription economy, we have churn. Um, there are numerous studies available there, uh, although majority of them sort of either cover subscription economy uh, or uh, or customer churn or uh, or also cover a lot of B two C areas. Uh, this is one such report which um, uh, which talks about churn, and as you can see, uh, the churn varies. Annual churn varies from anywhere uh, on the on the top end of about thirty eight percent to um, as low as uh, early 20%, uh, 21, 22%. Uh, but, but specifically in SaaS, uh, this particular report will sort of talks about um, how the, the churn itself, uh, the annual churn rates in SaaS um, are anywhere between 22 and 26, 27%. Uh, this is slightly dated, about 2017, and, um, and and you know, while we talk about churn, we thought it will also be a good idea to to start an initiative to do something very specific with the state of customer retention in specifically in the B2B SaaS industry, and that is something uh, that we're trying to do as part of the study, and we've just announced this survey uh, where we would invite you all to participate. Um, we're trying to address, using the survey, we're trying to collect as much data as we can, specifically uh, around the state of customer retention in the B2B SaaS industry, uh, talking about the average churn rates, uh, typical MRR retention, uh, when should you hire customer success leader, when should you hire your first customer success manager? How should your customer success org look like? Um, uh, should you have remote uh, success operations or should you have field customer success operations? And it's a lot of both strategic as well as tactical uh, pieces that you will be able to use uh, once we publish the report. Uh, but the report itself um, is gonna get this input and we invite you all to, to participate in the survey so that we can uh, we can do this study as effectively as possible. Uh, all the people participating, all the organization participating are going to get an early act, early copy of the report before uh, it gets released to public um, at large. So with that out of the way, uh, let's dive in um, to the topic for today. Now, before we handle the seven types of churn, we want to understand what is the reason for churn. Only then we will be able to categorize uh, the, the, the churn that we are, um, uh, that we are dealing with. Um, not all churn is identical. Uh, not all churn is avoidable. Um, but some churn is in, uh, some certain type of churn is an opportunity. Certain type of churn is something that shouldn't be there at the first place. A certain type of churn is acceptable, certain type of churn is completely not acceptable and, and like I mentioned, can be even an opportunity for you to improve. So the first step before you can kill churn is you want to understand what are the reasons uh, for the churn that you're seeing. So now this is where we want to get some insights uh, on the specific churn. Now we, what, we've, what we've put together here is a very simple process of getting to those insights. And we believe there are two key data sources that you can use. Um, one is essentially objective data points, which 
you know, this is data which is coming largely from your internal system, um, your CRM, uh, when has the customer started and things like those, how much were they paying, how old was the customer, stuff like that. And the second is subjective uh, insights on churn, which is largely around, uh, which are largely collected uh, by the means of interviews. And these are obviously uh, decently detailed interviews um, so that um, anything which is missed by data is captured here. So let's, um, and, and why are we doing this? Uh, once we understand why, you know, specifically from the interviews, it's actually the interviews which are gonna give you the real reason why is we will be able to um, associate and build a complete context uh, with the metadata that we gather from the internal systems. And, and any, any, uh, uh, any key reason which might not pop from the metadata will, will come out from interviews. Um, now, how much data should you, or rather, you know, how long back should you actually go looking for the reasons for churn? Uh, as a thumb rule, we say, if you look at the last quarter, so roughly about last 90 days, all the churn which has happened in the last 90 days should give you decent, um, uh, should give you a decent set. Sometimes you may even want to go back as, as back as uh, six months uh, or even a year, but it's definitely not more than a year, uh, never more than a year, because the reasons for churn will switch and change as your as your market progresses, as your customer changes, as the maturity of the market uh, changes, and uh, and as your product uh, would have gone through changes, your entire org would have gone through changes. The way you service your customer would have changed. So, uh, looking at uh, older data might give you. Uh, an insight which may or may not be valid anymore. So 90 days is the is the thumb rule, and that's sort of the best practice. But six months, uh, try avoiding even a year. the The next immediate question will be how much data, uh, so how many churn accounts you need to study to get to those insights. Um, now, if you're talking about a high ARPA per year um, versus low ARPA, so if you've got high ARPA, then Anywhere 20, 30 customers are, are good enough, even 10 customers, anything in double digits and high ARPA uh, should be able to give you uh, decent insights. 30 is a brilliant number there. Uh, low ARPA, where you're dealing with high volume, uh, uh, low ARPA customers, low ARPA, or sometimes you even call that ARPU, um, which is average revenue per account per year or per month, however you want to take it. Um, so low, uh, in case low ARPU, 100 customers uh, are going to be good. But again, um, in terms of the interviews, you can maybe restrict them to about 20, 25 uh, or so customers, and that should give you sufficient insights. Um, when, you're, when you're digging in, uh, either in the metadata or um, uh, via interviews, just keep in mind that the, what you're looking for is, is patterns. And once we see different patterns emerging of, hey, these are the certain reasons for churn, um, it becomes interesting from there on. So this is, um, this is how long back you wanna go. This is how many data points you wanna collect. Now, what are the specific data points we want to understand? So we believe there are 12 key data points that we wanna understand. Uh, we wanna start with the, date, the nine data points which you're gonna come from your, which you're gonna get from your internal system, uh, which will tell you who's leaving, when are they leaving, and uh, which was the internal team which is dealing with them. And when it comes to customer interviews, uh, we, are, we are trying to essentially ask why are they leaving and uh, what do they need to stay. So very specifically, who's leaving, you wanna understand the account name, the MRR, uh, the product, in case you're a multi-product company, um, then you wanna do this for every product. So the product name and the um, customer segment they belong to, depending on how you wanna segment your customers, uh, churn might be a problem in a particular segment or um, different segments might be churning for, for different reasons. Um, the second is, when are they leaving? We're still depending on our internal system to get those data points. What was the date of purchase? What was the date of leaving? So essentially what we're trying to establish is, what was the age of the customer uh, when they start to leave us? Is there a pattern? Are they leaving in the early 90, 30, 60, 90 days? They're in the onboarding phase. They're leaving after a year. They're leaving after three, four years. What's going wrong? This might throw a light. Uh, some some interesting uh, surprises might, might come out here. Um, who's the internal team? Um, sales reps? Success manager, support reps. If you if you have support reps aligned to a particular segment or a particular geography, um, in why sales reps? Uh, lots of times this question is asked. You might be surprised 
uh, I'll talk about this later, um, uh, but sales reps can, uh, it might be specific to certain sales reps and we'll talk about it when we get to that. Then we get to the subjective questions. Um, but essentially you're asking three questions. And the first one, the first two are why uh, are your customers leaving you? The first question we want to start with, uh, uh, you know, what was the original reason for purchase? We want to absolutely make sure we, we revalidate that, even if this is sitting in your internal systems, make sure you revalidate that. Uh, that itself might have changed and that might give you a different insight that three years back, the reason for purchase was different, but now they might have, the requirements might have changed. Um, so what was the goal of original um, uh, purchase at the time of the purchase? What was the reason behind purchase? And what was the reason behind leaving? And the last question is, um, what could you have done to keep them as a customer? So these are 12 data points that you want to collect. And once we have all of this data, that is when we get down to business. So this is where we want to segment our customers or segment the, the churned customers into seven key types of uh, churns. And, and these are those seven types. If you're going to zoom into each one of them. Number one, bad fit. Number two, missing functionality. When customer never started. Three, missed outcome. Users who buy left. Um, price or cost of ownership issues. And seventh, where the company either got acquired, merged, or, or shut down uh, its operations. Let's dive into each one of them. Number one, bad fit. Now, think of a bad fit customer as a customer that originally you should have actually never sold the product to at the first place it's the exact opposite of an ideal customer profile um, let's assume that um, uh, for, for 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 instance um, if your ideal customer is an automotive industry um, and that's the that's the industry you serve um, but all of a sudden you have this individual who's from the um, from a media industry, and you've ended up convincing them that the same functionality will do the job for the media industry, and the customer ended up buying. But clearly, your services, your, your templates, and whatever else you provide as part of the product was a mismatch. The customer is going to realize that sooner or later, and is going to churn. So the customer was a bad fit. Uh, the customer was looking for A, your, your solution is built to provide B. And this results in a conflict, which unfortunately in this case is identified post-purchase and hence results in a natural, if you ask me, a natural uh, churn. How do we deal with it? So the strategy for, for dealing with bad fit is very straightforward. You don't want these customers. Simple as this because they never belong. Uh, your, your product is never, just simply never built to serve this market. Um, frankly, if you're seeing a lot of demand for this market, you want to take a different call, whether you want to serve that market and then you want to build a different product or a flavor of your product to serve that market. That's a different uh, approach or a strategy altogether. But from the um, wearing the hat of uh, keeping your product uh, where it is and, and assuming we are not going to all of a sudden decide to enter a new market, um, you essentially want to train your sales team in recognizing an ideal customer. And this is purely a training problem. You want to maybe even document, hey, these are the traits of, a, of your ideal customer. This is the industry they belong to. This is the typical size of the org. Um, you're, you're selling typically to so-and-so individual. And if they are looking for feature ABC, or um, if these are some of the key problems that they're solving, then our product suits them best. And if they are trying to approach in a different way, maybe it doesn't suit you. All of that piece goes into training your sales team. Um, another tip um, uh, that I can provide, this is to make sure that your, uh, that your, uh, that your sales reps are super aligned um, to, the, to bringing only ideal customer profiles or only ideal customers as your customers. Uh, you want to make sure that you reverse the sales commission if a customer leaves in the first 90 days. Majority of the time, bad fit will be identified in the first uh, 90 days itself in the onboarding phase. And um, it's it'll be very difficult to see a reason that 
why a customer will leave after beyond 90 days or six months a year or multi-year later because of bad batch reasons, unless the underlying requirements have changed, which is a very different issue. Um, this is bad fit. And now before I jump to the second one, on the, on the side, uh, keep uh, throwing your questions, comments, anything um, you have in the chat. And um, uh, Nilesh, who's helping me uh, do this webinar is, um, if you're not in the same room or not even in the same city, so Nilesh, uh, feel free to chime in if, if you think there are questions I should stop in between and, and address. Um, sure, for me. So in you. fact, we have a question from Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy, for the pretty, like, these are some pretty good questions. He has two questions. One is, what would you do if the headquarter decides to build and go in-house? And the second one is, should we discount due to missing the go start date to stop a customer from churning? Interesting. So, uh, uh... Jimmy, if you don't mind, I think both of these questions, first of all, are very interesting. And um, let's look at the seven churn types uh, uh, as we as we go through now, and uh, then it'll be, and then let's come back and address these two questions, and hopefully uh, we will be able to do justice um, uh, to to both of them. So, with your permission, um, I'll keep moving forward. Um, and uh, so the second uh, key piece is missing functionality. Uh, now, this is more common that you would that you would think uh, that a critical feature is missing in the product, and hence the customer decides to leave. Now, if you put a little bit more thought behind this as to what is happening here, uh, we all have been buyers of the platform as well although we are now playing customer success roles in various capacity, but we have purchased software. And as every time I've purchased software, and whenever we've spoken to our customers as well, um, there is a significant effort, time involvement, and even cost in moving from a platform A to platform B. So there is significant pain in switching. Hence, uh, if, you, if you really look at it, if a particular feature is missing and the customer decides to switch, that pain of missing the feature, missing that particular feature needs to be far greater than the pain of switching, which, is, which by itself is huge because this is no less than a three to six months process of identifying the solution, um, of um, uh, evaluating various products, uh, moving the data, installing, retraining the team, all of that stuff. Um, plus, the pain of waiting for that 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 particular feature. So, majority of the times, we um, you know you can uh, one of the best ways to address this is you can reduce this gap by announcing your product roadmap. If you if you believe that your product roadmap can be misused or you don't want to announce it publicly, then you can certainly and you should announce it. Um, either to all your customers or at least to the customers who have been requesting that particular functionality and, and be upfront about, hey, that we are going to be releasing this later this quarter, later this year, whatever that case will be. And if you're not planning to release then I think then in that case, I'm assuming that, uh, that it's a misaligned um, a case of a bad fit rather than, than a missing functionality. Um, if you can let them know that this is coming, it will reduce the pain and they can see that, okay, for three months, maybe I can live without this particular feature. Maybe for this year, I can live without this feature. Uh, and post that, they will fix the problem and that becomes um, something that they can bear with. And, and the pain of switching might not be as huge as just dealing with it for about a year or whatever that time frame may be. So announce your roadmap, uh, either privately or publicly. Um, the second uh, approach to handling missing functionality could be, uh, now, this is where uh, uh, you can reprioritize your product roadmap. Now, you don't want to do that for every customer or every feature request, clearly not. But if you're seeing too many customers um, waiting or requesting the same feature and you see a clear uh, trend emerging, you are getting a very clear indication that that particular feature that you might have otherwise felt can be deferred or is not as critical is important and critical. Um, 
this is also where I would like to emphasize, uh, as you can see, customer uh, success is not necessarily responsibility only of customer success managers. Customer success as a function um, is how you, um, how you ensure as an organization that you're delivering success and not just product. You're delivering desired outcomes and not just selling licenses. And that, uh, and this is one of the ways in which you wanna bring in your, um, your, your product management, sit down with them and essentially help them understand that, hey, we have these customers who are, uh, who are looking to, uh, who are looking forward to this particular feature and hence might churn unless we reprioritize some of these features or at least announce them out. Um, another way of missing functionality, especially if this is well known at the time of purchase, again, some of the sales training might be helpful here, that you wanna set upfront expectations. Uh, that while you are expecting A, B, and C, D is something which is on the roadmap. Is this something that you can wait for for the next three to six months? Because that's when it is going to be out. And when you manage those expectations up front, um, it is, um, and the customer is not going to be surprised once they start using the product, uh, just in case they've not done a thorough evaluation. Um, and that way is uh, the customer is less likely to churn and you, you're going to be uh, more empathetic to, to, the, to the actual product roadmap, which is more realistic. Um, so those are some of the missing functionality strategies that you can adopt. Uh, frankly, of all these three, the easiest is just announcing your product roadmap and also training your sales team. I understand reprioritizing product roadmap sometimes can have other engineering and technical challenges um, and hence uh, can be uh, difficult to achieve in the first 90 days. Uh, but, um, you know, but if such is the trend, uh, do involve your product management in that. With that, let's move to number three, that the customer never started, never onboarded the product to start with. And, and here is why we need to understand why was the case that the customer never um, onboarded. Um, You'll be surprised that this is um, uh, one of the most common causes of churn that we've seen. Uh, again, it's well studied, well documented, that majority of the churn happens in the first 30 to 90 days. Um, and some of you might have uh, a more simpler solution. In that case, um, you might have an onboarding time period of anywhere between seven days, 14 days, or just 30 days. Uh, so it can, it can be sort of noticed or, uh, or seen even earlier. So if the customer never onboarded and you realize that was the issue, how would you deal with that? Now, again, um, um, multiple ways to handle this. Every product has two components to it. Uh, component number one is the value that the product delivers, which of course the customer is only going to get once they get onboarded. And the, and the second component of every, every product is the effort which is required to get to that value. You have to do like, first you have to uh, set up an instance, upload a bunch of data points, enable a bunch of integrations, to invite more users, uh, you know, set up and configure the system, understand the system, maybe even train the team and then you start getting some of that value. Let's assume this is a typical flow. For another, a lot more simpler system could be as simple as, let's take example of maybe, a, and the, you know, my previous flow was, let's say for a CRM, uh, where you will only see value over a period of time, maybe six months, a year down the line. Um, but uh, the, there could be simpler systems. For example, uh, a Google Analytics, um, where all you have to do is just deploy a script and you start getting data. And then obviously a lot of data and analysis requires a bunch of training and uh, such is the nature of, of Google Analytics. Uh, but, um, uh, but the effort to value is, is far less. So look at uh, your onboarding in terms of effort to value and time to value paths. And see if you can reduce uh, the time to value and effort to value. And by the way, 
our last webinar was specifically on onboarding framework and it addresses this problem and we've spoken about it in far greater detail it's a it's a complete framework which has emerged and one of the one of the areas which it which it tries to solve is how can we reduce time to value and effort to value and that in itself is going to ensure that more um, uh, the chances of customer never got started uh, reduces uh, one of the um, one of the uh, common mistakes that we've seen um, customer success managers or customer success uh, teams doing is that we try to train the customer on every feature of the product during the onboarding cycle and that typically ends up overwhelming uh, the customer increases the time to value increases the effort to value instead what you should be doing is you know just essentially focusing on what was the core reason for purchase and and take the shortest path to solve that particular problem while there might be like a ton more benefit that your product provides but that you can slowly <clears throat> excuse me that you can slowly introduce and educate the customer post onboarding uh, during the rest of the retention cycle, let's assume that you have an, that you have an annual um, a contract, and then uh, post ninety days, uh, the rest of the nine months can be used, or whatever those time durations work out. Um, another thing that you can do is make sure that help and support is available uh, for getting started, whether it is human driven, uh, like as in one to one, whether it is. Uh, via webinar in a self-serve manner, whether it is available as a chat, uh, whether your customer is using Intercom or any other chat platform over there, um, that can be very effective in, in solving some of these pains as well. Um, you want to guide, train, configure, and onboard customer, handhold them wherever needed. Some of these are very basics. Um, like I've already mentioned where you want to revisit uh, and streamline the process. And uh, we want to continuously monitor health during onboarding uh, it is critical that you set up health uh, of a customer account um, and configure it differently specifically during onboarding days there you want to see a different activity um, to track that health versus uh, for a customer which is already onboarded um, they're they're expected to behave differently and they will behave differently and make sure that is covered in your account health monitoring uh, piece as we um, move from there. So that was um, on if the customer never onboarded. Let's look at the next one. Um, customer completely missed the outcome. So the customer got onboarded, but could never achieve the desired outcome. And frankly, if there is one churn, which is completely unacceptable, it is this type of churn. Here, keep in mind, we're not talking about uh, missing functionality or a, or a, or a bad fit uh, or not even an, uh, a missed um, onboarding. Here we are talking about an ideal customer profile who purchased um, uh, the, your product to solve uh, or to solve the use case A and your product is built specifically to address um, this exact ideal customer profile of yours to solve the use case A. Uh, you onboarded the customer um, nice and good, but in spite of that, the customer missed the desired outcome. Um, this is where I will pretty much um, um, sort of make sure that my customer success team, customer success managers are on top of this very type of churn because they can address this single-handedly by and large. Uh, majority of the time, um, what we've realized when we when we dug into some of this um, uh, type of churn is we realized that the customers their own domain knowledge can be limited um, for example if somebody is adopting crm for the first time um, and they're they're moving from an excel to a crm although majority of the tech space crm is uh, is, is a very well understood space uh, but let's say if you are moving uh, from non-tech industries uh, some paper-based um, industries into CRM, it will be very challenging for them to understand how a CRM operates. Um, so it will be helpful to invest some effort preparing webinars, um, uh, preparing more education material, 
taking a university or a self-serve university type approach and creating enough um, material for customers to arm themselves with the domain knowledge of how technology can help them in that space. Uh, sales would have taken a shortcut to that, obviously, uh, showed them the value, but a lot of times sales will not cover how or the nuances involved. And this is where customer success team can step up and, and start to prepare that. And this can be a, a, you know, a complete division or department in its own rights. Uh, but within the first 90 days, you sh definitely should be able to uh, uh, to experiment with uh, by, by creating some of these pieces. Um, another trick here is, um, again, educating is the right approach, but education has its own learning curve. Uh, you will need to take time to develop that content and that itself has its own uh, sweet uh, scale. It's, it's not uh, something that you have as a machinery which is continuously developing uh, education material. So it might, it might require some time to you know, uh, build all of that. Uh, one, of the shortcuts, uh, one of the shortcuts that you can definitely apply in the first 90 days is go very, very prescriptive. Um, you understand that industry very well. Um, you can maybe segment your customers or at least uh, go prescriptive as as detailed as step one, step two, step three. If you do these three, uh, do, uh, the, do these three steps, you get from uh, point A to point B and point B is where the value is. And just, just make it very, very, very prescriptive for them. And that can be a good shortcut and education while it can happen on over a larger period of time. Um, Another uh, interesting way to handle this can be uh, product onboarding experience itself. Now, this is something to do with onboarding, uh, but getting started guides during onboarding and post onboarding can also be used. So this is something that overlaps between onboarding and, and missed outcome. Um, the third is you want to continuously analyze product usage data. Now, what I mean by that, uh, product usage data can be analyzed in two ways. Uh, one, of course, uh, uh, you want to look at the analytics from typical uh, analytics tools such as a mixed panel amplitude, all of those stuff. But um, but that kind of analytics usually uh, will serve a, a product manager to look at at a macro level how uh, uh, how customers are using the platform, uh, like out of the hundred, how many are clicking. Uh, to achieve a particular use case, how many are taking the path A versus path B versus path C. There might be multiple paths to approaching the same use case. But from a customer success perspective, um, these tools actually don't work out because that is where you don't want to look at a macro view. What you want to know is exactly how one particular account is adopting it. Hence, you want to set up or, or look at product usage data, not from a usage perspective, but, but from a perspective of are they getting value or not? And this is where you want to set up an account health or configure account health in a way that uh, uh, which sort of maps with product usage and product usage is, is the best proxy to understanding who's getting value and who's not. Um, and once we've understood, uh, once we can track um, which are those key value uh, pieces, once somebody, once somebody starts, once customer starts to use your product, it becomes um, very straightforward for you to see who's getting that value, who's not, and you will be able to um, clearly see that a certain set of customers are not able to hit that uh, missed outcome, and you don't have to wait till the anniversary of the renewal uh, before you sort of realize that. You will be able to see it much beforehand and uh, and address that, um, and then configure health in a in a way. Uh, that sort of enables you. Keep in mind, uh, it's not about all the product usage. Uh, like what we've seen is um, just um, just watching for how many times they're logging in, just watching for how many sessions they are having, just watching for how uh, you know how much time an account is spending on how many active users they have can can be false positives of health. Can be false positives. The right. Um, a way to configure health or, or analyze the right account uh, um, uh, account health will be to monitor are they getting value and that value for example here in terms of CRM can be 
um, are new leads flowing into the system? Is it connected to their web form, for example, if it's a digital or a, or a website driven lead generation engine? Um, are they creating opportunities? Are they tracking opportunities? Are they winning opportunities? What is the conversion rate between opportunity uh, and opportunity one versus uh, total opportunities? Some of those can be far more effective indicators and more realistic indicators of value delivered versus simply logging in how many of them are uh, one versus simply watching how many how many of how many of the users are actually active so that's um, the details around missed outcome um, number five users or buyers left the company now we are not talking about mergers here just to be clear we, we can address that um, in some of the later types here but here we are talking about the original sponsor of the product or a champion who might you might have created actually leaves the uh, leaves the organization either an exec or your champion who understood the product very well this can be the biggest surprise uh, we've seen some of the very well established, very well, um, uh, you know, even if the even if the product adoption was great, this can overnight change the story. And this can typically hit as a surprise. Um, it's a pure relationship game. Uh, you want to prepare early, um, and how can we do that? You want to prepare early. Uh, a, uh, you wanna uh, you want to have backups in advance. When I when, what I mean by backup, you wanna have more than one relationship uh, in a particular account. Especially, I mean, like okay, I understand. Let's say you have 500,000, 5,000 accounts. Okay, not possible to have multiple relationships in all the accounts. But definitely in your top segment, in your uh, in your high ARPA segment, in your top tier. Uh, you want to maintain more than one relationship, both at a champion level as well as at exec level, um, so that if one of those, um, uh, one of your champions or one of your executive or sponsor leaves, you always have a backup. Uh, if you do maintain good ongoing engagement uh, with your champions and with your uh, sponsors, you can always request them to hand over the relationship to whoever is taking over from them. And um, if done well, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we have seen uh, that this handover can, can actually, this handover is actually beyond introduction because they are essentially handing over the entire relationship. They're handing over the trust and the trust gets passed and it, it's a lot more easier to, uh, to navigate and work with the new champion and navigate that account uh, in the new org structure. Um, the third piece, let's assume you had no backup. It caught you as a surprise. What do we do then? Now, this is where I will, uh, uh, what, what we suggest is you want to treat this account as a brand new opportunity and bring in your sales representatives. Um, you want to look at a new sponsor, especially if it's sponsor, a new, a new exec, as a brand new selling opportunity. Um, just because you already have a contract, just because we already have some usage or some past adoption, um, does not mean that the new exec is actually convinced, uh, especially if the new executive is, is somebody from an outside, the organization has recently replaced uh, this individual who was your sponsor earlier. So sales guys uh, are best at, um, at convincing um, uh, about the value that the product delivers. Uh, they know uh, how to handle competition very well because they deal with that on a daily basis. Uh, this individual who might have replaced, might have a certain products that she's used in this uh, past lives and might have some favorites and hence will require that uh, comparison. Obviously, given that you are already in contract, given that you already have some onboarding, some uh, some footholding there in terms of product usage, all of that stuff will give you, give your sales guys a huge advantage. But I will definitely recommend uh, if you're, if this one catches you as a surprise, bring in your sales reps. And yes, you want to enable um, uh, 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 you want to enable and encourage, uh, sorry, and I will encourage you to enable that uh, sales commission uh, to be given to the sales representative. If not in full, definitely 50% uh, of the original if it was a fresh purchase. But for all practical purposes, if your sponsor is left, this, this account is, is a huge risk. Um, again, um, if you're monitoring product adoption, can give you better 
um, uh, better grip on the account, or at least you have more time before before the switch happens. But bringing in sales can be very very effective. Um, with this, let's move on to the next one, which is frankly um, the most interesting one. Um, customer leaves because the product was uh, because the price is uh, because the pri uh, your product all of a sudden appears to be um, uh, priced overpriced. Uh, and the customer essentially is moving to a low priced solution. Um, so here, uh, when you dig into this particular case, this is actually not just an overpriced issue. This has, this can, uh, this, this can be the signal which can be generated by any of the underlying three key issues. Uh, and let's look at each one of them. Um, Let's look at the first one. Product is genuinely overpriced. And if the product is genuinely overpriced, uh, you have to bring in um, a price and functionality parity. Uh, whether it is overpriced or not, you obviously wanna consider a various competition. Again, many years back, when you launched that particular pricing, you might be the right fit. Over time, maybe your, your, your industry, your, your market has become crowded maybe more functionality has been launched by your competitors. Maybe uh, the requirements um, of your uh, customers might have changed. And hence, which was very well, the value was al aligned well with the, with the fee that you're charging, uh, was, was right in the past, is not correct anymore. So either you want to increase the functionality uh, to match the price, which will obviously happen over time, or there might be a case that you want to bring down the price. Uh, and, and we're going to address this as part of Jimmy's question as well uh, on the discounting, which I'll address. Um, I'll try to address at the end of this point six. Um, so we want to address that. Uh, uh, so this is how you, uh, this is uh, the, the pricing piece. The next one, is that product is not fully used. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, let's assume that your product has 20 features um, and yours is product A, 20 features, um, and you're charging the right price, which is, uh, which is meant for the value delivered through those 20 features. Customer, on the other hand, left your product for a cheaper, low-priced, low-cost alternative, saying uh, that you're overpriced. And you're left scratching your head, thinking the, the product that the customer is left for doesn't even offer one-fifth one the functionality that your product can offer. So you are thinking A to B, apples to oranges comparison in your head. But a lot of time what we've found is that the customer himself or herself can only be using, you know, 10%, 5%, 20% of the actual functionality of your product. So out of the 20 features, the customer might only be using the top two, two or three features. And when a low priced um, competition offered those exact two or three features uh, in the head of uh, in, the, in the mind of your customer, it was an apples to apples comparisons because your customer never got to um, the, the remaining 17 features. And this uh, can very easily be caught if you are calculating, uh, which is what we call product stickiness. Uh, product stickiness, very simply, again, you can enhance the formulas, but very simply can be calculated as total number of unique features used um, divided by the total number of unique features available or offered as part of your product. Are, is 10% functionality being used, 20%, 50%, 80%, 100%. And this is something that we emphasize very highly on um, in the analytics uh, and all the product adoption detail that we offer within Customer Success Box. And I'll try to show you time permitting towards the end of this um, session. So. So keep in mind, product stickiness um, is key. And how do we address product stickiness? I will again recommend back to product onboarding um, session, but this is, um, this is a, a topic for 
another webinar altogether. Uh, how do we how do we develop product stickiness over time? But but this could be one of the reasons which is appearing uh, or bubbling up as an overpriced case, but is actually the case of product adoption uh, or uh, product stickiness. Um, the third one is that the customer is using your product. The customer is also using a decent chunk of functionality. But in spite of that, the customer feels that your product is overpriced simply because the customer is unable to understand or calculate the real ROI. And with this, allow me to sort of switch slides here. Um, this could be one of the easiest fix, by the way. Calculate the ROI and communicate the ROI effectively. Sometimes it might also be a case of communicating the total cost of ownership and making sure that we understand. Um, um, so effectively communicating ROI in a repeated fashion, whether it's monthly, whether it is quarterly, just making sure that, hey, um, your, let's say example of a CRM that you processed 200 opportunities through CRM, which is 10% more than last month. Um, uh, now you're able to handle more opportunities with the same same number of uh, sales team or or number of opportunities per sales rep has gone up or whether it is how many opportunities are closed whether it is about conversion rate or how many leads somebody is handling whatever the right metric that is for you to effectively communicate roi for that particular account um, you should certainly do it and if this is again a very high valued customer you have a customer success manager um, uh, dealing with this customer, I think it is worth a customer success manager's time to specifically dig out the specific ROI, uh, which clearly indicates for that particular customer that what have they achieved uh, through the product, and that uh, that can be very effective, specifically specifically on these high value accounts. Um, you want to definitely do a competition price analysis, you know, if you're gen just to make sure to, to, to always double check whether you're genuinely overpriced or not. And that's something again, would have, could have changed and the product stickiness, I think we've already covered that. So that was number six. Now, uh, uh, Jimmy, I'll try to address the, the question that you, that you brought up, which is very interesting. Should you offer discounts for, um, uh, Nilesh, can you help me, uh, help me understand? Should you offer discount in, in what case when the functionality is not there? Or, or was it delayed on when you miss a, miss a go start date yeah so delayed onboarding should you offer um, uh, should you offer uh, discounts there um, uh, okay so so let's understand the word discount first of all um, I, I think uh, as SaaS or, or rather being more broader in subscription economy we are definitely not trying to make a one-time sale Subscription economy, you know, the underlying value proposition here is uh, the, we will give you a stream of value. It's a stream. It's not one time value. It's a stream of value every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year, you deliver value to the customer. In return, the customer is delivering a stream of revenue. It's not one time. It's a stream of revenue. And hence, because we are interested in stream, um, the discount word cannot be applicable in terms of percentage for sure you're not talking about give me a 10 percent discount because 10 percent is going to be your 20 percent discount is going to be applicable over the lifetime of that of that customer and i discourage that under all circumstances unless you are you know wrongly priced and there might be one scenario which is a sales uh, story um, so so I will definitely discourage a percentage discount, which is applicable month on month, year on year, quarter on quarter, not that. Uh, what I'm comfortable with, if there is a genuine miss and a delay, uh, let's say there was a three months delay, uh, the reason might be, you know, at the side of the customer, at the side of the onboarding, it could be whatever, but I think it is absolutely fair uh, to, to extend the, the, the uh, you know the 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 timelines, and whenever we ourselves um, uh, get into uh, situations where we believe that the integration is going to take longer, it's a little bit more complex, or um, uh, if there were a challenge or, or two on the customer's end or our end, uh, we always offer the first year we can extend even up to fifteen months uh, for the same price. Because again, come the second year, it's back to normal twelve months 
uh, year for the same price. Uh, but for the first one, three months might be an onboarding time. Sometimes it's months, sometimes it's three months, but we are very flexible there. Uh, so discount in terms of adding more months, absolutely. Uh, if you think it is fair, uh, I believe it should be offered very, I'm very comfortable doing that. Um, but offering it as a percentage, unless there are other reasons for it, um, uh, is something that I will not recommend. I hope that sort of answers your question. Uh, Nilesh, in case there is a comment from uh, Jimmy on chat, do, do let me know. Otherwise, I'm moving to the next one. Um, and Jimmy, I'm sorry I cannot monitor the, the, the chat because I've got a full screen on the, um, on the slide here. So let's look at this, the, the last one here. Um, the company got acquired, more is closed. Frankly, if the company got closed, there's nothing that you can do. And if the company got acquired, but this becomes another interesting scenario or merge. Whenever there is a case of acquisition or merger, uh, you don't know which executive is going to take over this particular division. You don't know who's going to call those shots. Uh, again, you want to treat this as a brand new opportunity. Yes, because you already have an ongoing contract, some product options, some product usage. You, your, your sales reps will have a slightly upper hand over competitors. Uh, but the competitor might already be established in the in the organization which just got acquired. So you want to bring in a sales rep, treat this as a brand new sales opportunity. You want to push this back in the sales funnel. And yes, you want to pay the full sales commission, uh, not even 50% in this case, a full sales commission, because this will require a completely new navigation, completely new, new relationship building for that particular sales rep. Um, so it's as simple as this. Again, customer success, uh, this again sort of talks about that it's not just a function of, um, it is not just a function of customer success managers alone, uh, but a lot of times you want to bring in other parts of the organization to help you here. So with this, um, you know, we sort of have finished all seven types of um, um, customer churn and how you want to deal with them. Um, so this is roughly the 90 day plan that we recommend, which, which uh, uh, we've tried um, and it works within the 90 days, especially if you're not going after the big chunky ones, you, you obviously cannot control and add new functionality within 90 days, but you can certainly release product roadmaps. I believe you're able to connect. Um, the first week is usually good enough to collect the data. And then you want to filter down on the people you want to interview within the first week and then you know, finish the interviews the next couple of weeks. And by week four, you've already segmented. Um, you start to implement the strategies in the next four weeks, and then you want to monitor the impacts in the last four weeks. And I and I guarantee you will see um, uh, an impact in the churn. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, you cannot deal with all seven types at the same time. Like some of them are like, okay, bring in the sales guy here and there. It's just about educating your success managers there. Uh, that's more straightforward, but, uh, but you want to, you know, pick your battles and see which is the most, uh, uh, which type of churn is affecting you the most and then um, start from the biggest leak in the bucket. Um, once you plug that one, then you want to get to the next, uh, which now it will be the biggest leak in the, in the bucket and then go on from there. It's 90 days for each type of churn and, and I'm sure you're going to make a lot of progress. Um, very simple plan. Uh, the entire uh, webinar is available as an ebook and a blog uh, for you to download um, uh, Nilesh is actually going to follow up with an email, uh, which will have the recording. Uh, it will, there will also be an email following requesting you to participate in the state of churn survey uh, and participate in the study and get your hands on the early access copy there. And, um, and there will also be a link to uh, the ebook um, on how to reduce customer churn and the exact same stuff. With that, um, uh, I'm going to quickly walk you through um, um, customer success box, which is the, the platform um, that we are, um, um, that we built for, um, for all the, um, for all our customers to help you with technology in the journey um, to fixing churn, improving upsell, getting better MRR retention rates, um, all the good stuff. So let's look at that. So once uh, you've logged in, so this is where I've logged in. I've logged in as, as James Brown, uh, which is a fictitious success manager for a CRM 
uh, which is the use case that we're taking here. So as James, I'm able to see all my portfolio. I've got 25 accounts in my portfolio. I can see the health. Um, I can see which, which account is doing what, all the data points that, that sort of come in and you can, you can do more data. Um, I can enter my own details that, hey, this account is expected to renew. Um, this account is at 2.5K. I expect they're gonna move to, let's say, 5,000 and I believe this account is going to upsell and I can that phase enter. But the most interesting piece is health, which we're gonna to come to very quickly within my portfolio, if I wanna further uh, divide it into segments, so these are the accounts which are onboarding. This is one segment that we've created and you can have as many segments as you'd like. Um, you can set up rules which will sort of um, uh, make an account enter a segment once that, once that criteria is met. Um, and they will, the accounts will also leave or exit the segment once the criteria is no longer true for that particular account. So these are the accounts which are currently onboarding. These are the accounts which are, which are coming up for renewal in the next 30, 60, 90 days, however you would like to set it up. These are my enterprise accounts. Again, you can create as many segments as you, as you like um, by simply setting up criteria. Uh, so for example, if I just quickly take you to some segments, uh, again, given our time limitation, I don't want to uh, dive too much into this, um, but you can set up, for example, your onboarding rule over here is set up very simply as all the onboarding, um, which is um, subscription started on uh, in the last 90 days or something like that, or activated on in the last so many days, and you can set it up accordingly. Now, let's look at the most interesting part, which is health. Um, health is if you ask me the most critical component of customer success technology, uh, because it is the health which will um, orchestrate a customer success manager's attention. So if you, as a, as a success manager, when you come in the morning, you look at your portfolio of accounts and use, and the, it's the health indicator which tells you, or any other alert indicator as well, but primarily the health indicator that tells you that, hey, this is the account that needs your attention today and here is why. So all that details. So we've, we've created our health very simple on the outside, good, average, and poor. You clearly know which account needs your health, uh, which account needs your attention. And then we've made it extremely flexible internally uh, that you can set up very advanced rules, which will sort of allow you to even set up variables at an account level uh, and create all those based on product adoption, on usage adoption. So for example, in case of um, the CRM, um, uh, opportunities one should at least be 15% of the total opportunities every 30 days. And this is a real value delivered. And hence, it's, it's these core um, uh, health definition, which are far valuable than just logging, just monitoring how many people are logging in. And I hope uh, I'm able to sort of help you understand that part. Uh, we also, I've got to show you, we also calculate things like, um, uh, product stickiness, like I was talking about. So you can uh, you can say the product stickiness is greater than 60 and so on and so forth. Um, you can set up different criteria for, for different segments, like we've created an enterprise segment. So, so this is a different criteria that you can set for different segments and that can be further more effective. You can be serving different industries, different type of customers, different personas, uh, different use cases, and hence, uh, different health will definitely make sense. And during onboarding, you absolutely want to set up a, a very different um, health parameter. Okay, now with that, let's go ahead and zoom into uh, a few of these accounts. I'm going to just randomly um, sort of go ahead and open some of these uh, and zoom into a few of these accounts here. Cool. So now I'm looking at uh, a particular account. You're able to see the health for the last 60 days um, as dots, overall a 360 degree view. Uh, what's the forecast? What's the MRR? What segment it belongs to? Active, last active date, all that basic stuff. Um, what stage uh, the account is on and you can update all of that in terms of life cycle. Now this is where you're looking at milestones, which I was talking about real product adoption. Uh, sorry, here sort of this is meeting the milestones randomly, usually uh, uh, this is a simulated case. Yeah, this looks a little more realistic here, this particular account. So Cisco, 
which is obviously a simulation, um, is an account which went all the way to logging activities, but never was, uh, the leads are not getting updated. And this is where maybe you wanna pick up the phone, deliver a one-to-one -one training or invite them for a webinar and, and educate them about or train them on updating the leads and you know exactly why this account has an average health, where are they stuck, which milestone has achieved or not. And this is not a check on checkbox. This is where you track real product adoption and you can create as many milestones as you'd like uh, to, to see where the accounts are, are stuck. Like this particular account was able to successfully achieve all the milestones, but at this account, uh, only a handful are missed this one has almost missed almost all of them. So you sort of know how much product adoption is done, which is very different from health. Health is the ultimate goal and product adoption is, think of product adoption or these milestones as path leading up to good value. So as an account sort of moves down and starts to check all these product adoption uh, light bulbs light up, um, uh, the customer is essentially, uh, the account is essentially adopting the product, getting more value from the product, increasing the product stickiness, and uh, you, you know your users are becoming from basic users to intermediate to advanced and becoming more champions. Um, we have built as part of customer success uh, box. We believe um, customer um, uh, customer success technology is not just analytics. So analytics is necessary but not sufficient. And this is where we emphasize on actionability. Um, it's just not about looking at okay what data points are there and going back to your traditional tools. Uh, here we've built everything from right within the platform to a Gmail sync. You can send emails, you can set up uh, different um, uh, templates. You can even, even send out um, some key value metric. You can set up those templates here, uh, pull the data specifically for that particular account, set notes, tasks, log different events, QBRs, all of that stuff, and even make phone calls uh, from right within the um, account and everything gets logged and recorded right here. We cover um, multiple um, countries, like I think more than 100 plus countries are covered here. All the all the um, conversation, all the updates, all the engagement is maintained in a single timeline. You don't miss anything. Uh, all that data, more user level data. So far, you were looking at only account levels. This is the user level data that you can see more around health. This is where you see some tickets integration and things like those. Um, more tasks and subscription and all of that stuff. I'm gonna quickly move to the task segment now. So of course you were seeing individual tasks there and this is your overall task board. So as a success manager, you come in and look at all the tasks. You can filter um, like, okay, which are my onboarding tasks for a particular account due in the next seven days and I can apply those filters. Um, all the alert risks, uh, all the alerts will come up here, whether they are risk alerts or upsell alerts or renewal alerts, all of them will show up and also uh, an email will hit uh, respective success managers uh, who want to, who are, um, who have their, uh, who have those accounts in their portfolio. Um, very quickly walking you through playbooks here. Again, um, you know, you will not be able to do justice to everything, but our playbook are specifically designed to, to promote product adoption and not just uh, process tracking. So process tracking, for example, you can see that, that in kickoff call, um, you're supposed to complete these two tasks and they're also available on the task board. Installation guide is, installation guide is not sent out yet. Once I do that, I can mark as done. Uh, all of that stuff. But in addition to that, for every playbook, we also monitor whether the milestones which were expected to be achieved as part of this playbooks have been achieved or not. So again, constant emphasis on real product adoption, whether it is an onboarding playbook, whether it is an upsell playbook or any other playbook. Um, um, other goals which can be met offline, identify a champion, create power users, all of that detail is, is met. Again, very actionable. You can make phone calls from right here. We can send emails, all of that stuff. So very, very effective playbook. Accounts either move forward automatically once the milestones are met, or you can, you can drag and drop them if you don't want them to move automatically. They get highlighted whenever you miss any particular uh, timeline, like this step is supposed to be completed in nine days. If it's sort of missed out, let's say in case of lens card, uh, you will be able to see that it was, it was due a couple of weeks ago and enhance all this stuff. Uh, I think with that, um, 
we are going to open up for Q&A. Um, I've not shown you one last thing. I mean, like the report section, if you care about that. Um, all right, so, so some basic reports uh, around health, renewals, user reports, financial metrics, uh, operational, all of that stuff. Cool. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna close the walkthrough at that point in time, and uh, I'm gonna now open up the call for Q and A. Uh, are we over time? I think we are. We are over time, but we'll take a couple of quick questions. The first one is from Nancy. Nancy says, uh, Nancy asks, when does this 90-day plan begin? When customer announces churn, or part of onboarding to avoid future churn? If a customer auto churns, he might not take time to share the feedback. So, okay. Uh, so the 90 day plan begins. Uh, this is not really a customer. It's, it's not really, you know, a call of the customer or a customer. So it's not connected to the customer life cycle. Um, what we are talking about here is that as an organization, you have a certain churn percentage, which is, no matter what that percentage is, churn is churn, it's not healthy. Um, and you want to, at some point in time, look at how can you improve that um, and, and reduce the churn or improve your retention. And you make a commitment as an organization that we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna roll out this plan in the next 90 days and we're gonna come out uh, with an improved retention rate at the end of it. And uh, whenever you wanna do that, I think whenever you're ready, tomorrow, next week, next quarter, um, I think this plan can be effective. Um, uh, to your second question of uh, whether the customer will be available for an interview or not, um, what we've seen, uh, no matter how, uh, what were the terms at the time of churning, uh, customers always love to provide feedback. Customers always love uh, to be heard, even if you've left and um, uh, in our experience, um, People are generally open if you reach out with the right attitude, with the right um, uh, openness. Um, feedback is golden, um, um, and, and I think um, if you if you reach out with that approach and attitude and with an ability to learn, I think you'll you'll find uh, a lot of customers willing to speak to you. Okay. All right. So we'll take one more question from Iftikar. Iftikar asks, let's say we had 10 features initially when a customer is onboarded, but over time we realized two of them don't fit with our vision. And hence we stop or quit two of those features. Now, if a customer decides to move out of due to those two features, how should it be handled? So, uh, so if the car, I think, I think it's a very practical uh, uh, problem that you're dealing with. So essentially what happened was when you were building the platform, maybe a few years back, um, um, you felt that this particular customer is the right fit. You brought them in. The feature also existed. Two years later, you realize, you know, you don't want to serve that particular use case anymore. As a product strategy, maybe that market is not big enough. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, you know, you don't want to invest in that use case for uh, for, for a variety of other business and strategic reasons. Um, a, um, I think you should reach out literally proactively to these customers and say, we brought you in uh, to help you serve those, uh, to, to help you uh, sort of address all of these use cases, including uh, the two that you are um, now decided to get rid of and letting them know that you will no longer be, um, that you will no longer be supporting or building your product any further um, to serve these two um, to, to serve these two use cases that you've decided to roll back, number one. Uh, but you don't want to do that over time, uh, overnight. Uh, you want to announce um, a sort of a, what we call um, a rollback um, or a retirement, uh, feature retirement um, schedule, which can be anywhere between, depending on how large or small that feature is, how large the impact or small that impact is, anywhere between three to six months, all the way to up to two years. Um, and depending on, again, how valued those customers are, what is the dependency, what was the original commitments made, you can even extend um, 
and keep them on an older version if that's possible at an engineering level and give them extended period of time that we're going to roll that back for everybody else but because you're already using it so you can continue using it but six months later we will not be able to support it we will not be able to debug it and things like those and essentially telling them that either they need to live without it and let them take that call given what their business scenarios is or uh, you're essentially requesting them and giving them enough time to go hunt another platform and then move on there's nothing that you can do about that churn. I think it's a business decision that you've taken. Um, but having that conversation before you take that decision that, hey, um, how critical is this particular feature to you? Uh, again, monitoring the actual product adoption there will be, uh, uh, will be very effective. You will have more data points, but you can certainly interview them, uh, which will hopefully help you, um, which will hopefully give you more data points before you decide to pull that, uh, take that decision and pull that pull that plug on that feature and will also help you decide whether three months is good enough or three years is is what you need to you know keep as a retirement uh, period thank you um, we'll just take one quick last question which is from jimmy who yeah. asks how do you define success and how how do you monitor the desired outcome How do we? Uh, uh, how do you define? How do you define success, and how do you monitor the desired outcome? Great. Uh, again, uh, I, I think uh, Jimmy, great question here. Great question. Um, I will recommend uh, for a detailed answer. Look at the check out our last webinar on uh, on although the topic is onboarding, but we do start by um, what does success mean for your customer. Um, I'll try to answer it briefly here. Success is not defined by the organization or by the vendor. Uh, success is defined by the buyer uh, uh, or, the, uh, or the end user here. What is success for them? Um, you need to ask your customer. And if, for example, a CRM use case that we've been using all through, uh, in, uh, uh, so let's say, okay, so what we found different customers buy the same product for different reasons. So interestingly, if you've, for example, three customers who would purchase the same CRM might have three different success definition. Customer A might say that, hey, I would like to purchase a CRM because I want to, my, my leads keep getting dropped um, and we, are, we have a very huge turnaround time on leads. So maybe the success for them is, can I integrate their web form, bring in the leads and quickly pass it to the respective reps in different territories and, and, improve, the, uh, and improve the response time? And that's it. That's success for that particular customer. Customer B might say that, hey, uh, I have a distributed team across global, uh, across the domestic market or, or worldwide. And my problem is that I want everybody on the same platform. Um, for, for this particular customer, uh, success might be that everybody is looking at the same data. There's a single source of truth. Um, use case three for CRM might be, uh, I have uh, an account. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, for, for them, the use case might be that we want to improve our conversion rates or get a better handle on forecast. For them, uh, for that particular account, that's success. And once you're able to identify uh, different use cases, uh, then ideally, you would like to configure different um, uh, health and uh, sorry, uh, you want to configure health um, uh, account health uh, to cover different personas or different segments, uh, which basically cater to each of these use cases or aligned with these use cases. So there is no one golden definition here. Uh, I think we need to understand uh, that our customers do buy our product for different reasons. Uh, again, Majority of the times, it's two or three use cases that what we've what we've found uh, every product is serving, and those two three segments are very important. Uh, two three use cases are very important. Depending on what you're doing, it might just be one as straightforward. In that case, you want to monitor uh, actual value delivered, like I mentioned. And uh, I think the amount of questions you're asking is almost recommending. Uh, uh, we will try to address it in, in, in some of our future webinars uh, as to how you should configure health. And we'll talk more about milestones and paths uh, to good health and, and the health itself. All right, guys, we, I know we are 
almost like 15 minutes over time. So I guess we'll stop the Q&A here and come to an end of the webinar. We'll definitely get back to you individually over the questions asked. I know there are a few questions unanswered. So we'll email you as soon as possible with the answers to your questions. Uh, do look for our email with the recording and the ebook as well as the survey. We would love to have you participate in the survey and get an early copy of the report. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar. Our next webinar will be announced shortly, maybe in a couple of days. So look for, I look forward to seeing you guys again on the webinars and follow us on Twitter at CUST Cast Success Box for more updates, blogs, webinars, etc. Thank you guys. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you, everyone. Hope you found it valuable. Take care. Cheers.